It's about time because we're going there. Gird your loins, friends. It is a new season of We're Going There, and we are going hard. Yes, not only is it the beginning of a new season, it's the beginning of a new year. And with this new year, everyone has New Year's resolutions. The number one resolution that faces not just Americans, but people across the globe is, drum roll please, brrr, weight loss. And so what I want to do is I want to dismantle diet culture. I want to have conversations about what is health and bring on people who are experts to talk about this. And this week's episode is a little bit different because it's not just one, not just two, not just four. It's five episodes. Yes, this week, because this topic was so big, I knew that we had to spend time really, really unpacking it. So welcome to the crazy. I'm so excited that on this episode, and as I like to say, this week's emphasis on the S. This week's episode, we have registered dietitian and nutritional therapist, Leslie Schilling on the show. Friends, please welcome Leslie to the show. Leslie, thanks for coming on the show. I'm so excited to talk this week with you. I am so excited to be here. Okay. So before we dive in deep, there is going to be some skeptic out there that's like, wait, why should I listen to Leslie Schilling? What is a nutrition therapist? Like, how do I get, how can I trust this woman? So in a second, I want you to tell us a little bit about who you are, your passion for food, your passion for really bringing freedom around this concept of diet culture. Uh, but before that, I have to, I just have to insert and tell people a little bit of our history. So we originally were going to do one episode together. Do you remember yeah. this? I this do. is a few weeks ago. And we were, I don't even know, uh, 12 minutes in, where my I'm so mind blown that I interrupt and what do I pitch to you? <laughs> you're like, well, at first I thought you were just gonna say, girl, you're crazy. I'm not doing this. I really thought you were gonna say that. And but then <laughs> but then you were like, We this this won't work. This has yeah. to be this has to be a series. Yeah. And I was like, oh, OK, good. She's not like, goodbye, lady. No, no. It was like my mind was passing so fast. And I, I literally had a pen at my desk and my notebook. And I said, OK, I'm going to interrupt you right now. And it's documented. It, it's documented. In fact, producer Madi, I want you to take a sound clip from that. And I want you to put it into the podcast, because I think at one point I said, this is far too much. This is too good. This is not a 30 minute episode. This is a week of episodes. <laughs> Okay, so we're going to cut the, what I'm about to say from the podcast, but I'm sitting here and I'm like, yeah, this isn't a 30 minute conversation. <laughs> it's not. <laughs> it's not. Oh my God. This is what happens when people work with me. They're like, oh God, every time Bianca says I have this idea, it's going to cost money or it's going to be a lot of work. I we have it. this idea. What if we did a five day series on this? So Leslie, I'm so honored that you are giving us this time. Will you tell us a little bit about who you are, your education, and where this passion for, I'm going to call it food freedom. You haven't called it that, but you can just add that to your title and your bio. But please take us to the promised land of freedom. Yeah. Well, so I'm a registered dietitian and that requires um, an undergraduate degree in a lot of places, a like a graduate degree. So I have a graduate degree also in nutrition and I did, you know, a lot of exercise science and sports nutrition work in that too. Um, so, and then you know, kind of jumped into the, the baby dietitian world and fell into doing some work around eating disorders. And then a bunch of therapists swooped me up and took me under their wing and really turned me into what I feel like I am today, which is a, is a nutrition therapist. So I help people start to have freedom with food by seeing kind of the craziness that's happening in our culture that makes us fear food and our bodies. And I was trained very weight centrically, like thinking like weight equals health, um, as most health professionals were. And I went through this period myself of um, having to be challenged of if, if I'm going to practice this way, I could be bringing people to harm. And is there a different way? And now, um, yeah, I'm a nutrition therapist hoping to help people see diet culture and break free from it. Well, you are passionate about your work. And in the short time that I have gotten to know you, I feel uh, very, very exposed. And so I feel like we just need to lead with the end in mind. Uh, I, for those around these here parts on the podcast, know that I am an ardent believer and supporter of therapy and theology. Or let me put that differently, theology and therapy. I believe that when you have good, solid 
train coaches around you. You can develop the healthiest and best version of you. And the greatest gift that we can give to our loved ones is the healthiest version of us. Now, what I want to go deeper and discover this week is that health, like you already said, is not a number on a scale. I've been on this journey. I've written about my food struggles in my first book, Play With Fire. I addressed it lightly in my second book, How to Have Your Life Not Suck. And in Grit, Don't Quit, I was very honest about the struggles that I have been facing my weight in this last decade. And uh, a little bit of my journey is that I am very open with so many aspects of my life. I feel like the best leaders are those that are uh, transparent about certain areas of their life. But there was always two areas, if I can use biblical language, that were like my sacred cows, where I was like, we're not going to talk about this. The first one were my kids. I want my stepkids to have privacy for their life. And I want their faith to be their own. And I don't want to put them out on social media or talk about them publicly on stage because I want them to know that I am a trusted figure in their life and that their relationship with me is the most sacred to me. The second is my weight. I have struggled vehemently with my weight my entire life. And I'm very private about that struggle. The thing with this struggle versus like a porn addiction or alcoholism is that it's very outward facing. So it's been something that I've struggled with my whole entire life. And this is where we're going to start the podcast. I didn't know that I was obese. I was called words as a child, you know, fat. So, hey, fatty, Uh, I'd run and people would be like, oh, it's an earthquake. I never knew what cottage cheese was until someone pointed out that it was on my legs, a young boy who shall remain nameless. Uh, But I remember where I was when I started being very aware of my body and what yeah. is that. But I didn't know I was obese until I stood on a scale at CVS, which is for those that are not familiar with Southern California, it's a drugstore chain, like a Dwayne Reddy or uh, a different type of ABC store, wherever you're from. It was just like a drugstore that sold ice cream. And they had the best thrifties ice cream at this one CVS. And I had a, I had an ice cream cone in my hand and an ice cream. And for a quarter, you could step on a digital scale. And so I put my dig- quarter in and I stepped on the scale and the, the red letters of my weight popped up. And then it had like a column of like health related. And then red was the last column and it said obese. And I had to put in my gender, my age, and then spit out this number and said that I was obese. And it was then that I realized I weighed more than my father and obese was like, it was a death sentence. So from that point, from the age of 12, into the age of 25, I counted that I have been, actually I stopped counting because I hit 80 diets and then I, I just lost track of how many times I have gone on and off the dieting bandwagon. I really do feel like I'm Oprah. You know, it's just like, I do a juice cleanse and lose 30 pounds and look at me in my Jordache jeans. And then, you know, you come out and say, I love bread. You know, I, I just feel like the pendulum swings really, really far. And so this conversation, you as someone who's passionate about, I'm going to, I'm going to add this to your bio, whether you don't, whether you do or don't, but you are passionate about food freedom. And I, in the conversations I've had with you, I, I feel like I'm getting to this place of understanding food and understanding my body. And I'm reading your book, which we'll talk about in a second, but uh, also as a nutrition therapist and a licensed dietitian, talk to us about diet culture. I had never even heard that word until I picked up your book and I started talking to you, but let's, let's break this down. What yeah, is diet yeah. culture? Is it pervasive in our culture today? Well, I think you, you totally teed that up because when you were 12 and you stepped on that scale in the CVS, that was diet culture. That was, that was something telling you that your body is wrong and there's something you need to do about it that usually ends up in you spending money in some fashion. <laughs> and so, and, and you just gave me what I would, I would ask you if you were sitting across from me in my office, you know, what led you to feel this way? And you just described the moment that so many people in our culture have the moment that something or someone in this cult- culture told you that your body was wrong. Mm-hmm. And so And that's all comes from diet culture. And diet culture is a system of beliefs that falsely equates health with thinness, but it also, it's so much bigger than that. It's, it's, it's about 
all the diets and poor, poor diet, poor um, Oprah is kind of like, she's well known in diet cultures and, and, and blessed. She's, she's really had a struggle. Um, but it is this system that leads us to believe that we always need to be seeking thinness as health, as worthiness, as um, a means to everything, like happiness, love. That's what we're told and sold. Okay, so it feels like we've been at war with our bodies. Yeah. It feels like um, me looking at culture at the age of 12 and then having these red numbers pop in glaring form yeah. and an arrow pointing to obese, that it wasn't just, hey, make a decision to be healthy, it really was associated with what you define, and we'll talk about this in a second, but this hierarchy that's based on body size. Right. This wrecked me because I think you put language around what I thought. I, I joke around this, I joke about this in sermons. I say this often, this elusive thigh gap. Like I thought, if my thighs don't touch, then my life would be better. I would be happier. I would be more attractive. I would love myself more, but I am Hispanic. My thighs are going to touch until the day I die, you know, but there was something associated with thinness yeah. and power and acceptance and love and beauty and wholeness. So can you, um, to make sure that we understand this is our foundational episode, this is where this we're going to build up yeah. and outwards upon, but I really feel like it's crucial for us because most people don't understand diet culture. I've never heard right. this term diet culture. Can you define diet culture for us? Yes. So diet culture is this system of beliefs that one elevate elevates thin bodies, also elevates certain types of foods and equates thinness with health and worthiness and beauty and all the things. Um, and it's, and it's, it touches every part of our culture, everywhere we, everywhere we go. Okay. And tis the season. This is like the diet Olympics. We've come out of binging out of candy on Halloween and then um, holiday part. Oh, then Thanksgiving, of course. And, you know, not one, not two, not three, but four Friendsgivings as we lead into that. And then we go into Christmas and where there's holiday parties and cookies at the office and then Christmas breakfast and Christmas dinner. And then now we've hit New Year's and everyone feels like, okay, now it's time to compete in the diet Olympics. So, <laughs> yeah little bit about um, why we have been conditioned to think that um, that a, a tiny body, a thin body is the goal. Um, yeah. One of well, the things you, you, you wait, wait, you said something really powerful and I'm, 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 I want to make sure fix it because I might get it wrong, but you had said something along the lines of, you didn't call it shopping privilege, but essentially thin people never have to question about whether or not they're going to fit into something because it right. is a privilege of the their skinny privilege. Oh, that's what you called it. Skinny privilege. Talk well, to us a little bit. Body, yeah, body privilege. And that's that hierarchy that yes. like, there's no hierarchy. Like God loves you. God loves me. God loves everybody, right? There's no hierarchy in God's love, but in our culture, diet mm -hmm. culture has developed this hierarchy of um, how bodies should look that, and, and it is unfortunate. And there is a, there is an element of body privilege. And I used to think that, oh, I work hard and I work out and I eat the this and the that. And then I realized that like that, none of that really matters. It's my genetics. My genetics tend to lead me to how my body's going to end up. And of course there's some lifestyle and disease states and all the things that, that go into this. But for example, like I could go into Target, or I could go into, you know, Neiman Marcus or wherever and pick up a, pick up a pair of pants or a dress, and they would likely have a size that would fit me. That is body privilege. Um, I can sit in an airplane seat and not ask, you know, not have somebody eyeing me if I kind of spill over a little bit. That is body privilege. And so, a lot of times people don't realize that we can walk through this world without feeling the feeling the impact that a lot of people in larger bodies feel. And, and we do that to other people and diet culture programmed us to do that to other people because diet culture makes us think that think that larger bodies are not okay and that are not natural yet. They've always been with us. Body diversity has always been with us. Okay, 
Okay. Now, for all of our listeners that think that I'm going to be part of the bossy posse or that I am going to be contrarian, I already spoke to nutrition therapist Leslie about this first. And I said, how I process is by poking holes. And I'm always mindful of the skeptic that's listening. Whether I preach, whether I write, whether I'm podcasting, I'm always thinking about the person who's contrarian saying, wait a minute. Because the first time that you and I had this conversation about body diversity, I was a little... Uh, I was a lot of bit skeptical because I was like, yeah. no, that's not true. Because someone's sitting there popping Cheetos in their mouth and, you know, s- sucking down Snicker bars. They don't deserve to have the privilege of going into a Target and pulling anything off the uh, 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 off the rack. But then I started thinking about it. Wait, Leslie's right. God created in different ethnicities, in different cultures, in different body makeups, different sizes. And I thought about this. Ever, it, it hasn't left me since we discussed, but I look at some of my Samoan friends that are gorgeous and beautiful and are part of our community here at the father's house. And then I look at some of my Japanese or Korean friends or Vietnamese friends who are so much smaller in stature that try as they may, they will never be the six, eight Samoan that we have here at church by the name of Cody. Try as they may, they will never be like him. And so I started thinking about, wait a minute, if God intentionally crafted different ethnicities and different cultures to look different, whether you're a Nordic or a Swede versus somebody that is Hispanic, like try as I may, I'm never going to be over six feet. You know what I'm saying? Like I'm just genetically not like destined for that. When you start speaking about that, it really, it really made me think differently about how I want to start seeing beauty in body diversity. So for somebody out there, will you just address the skeptic I mean, we're going to, we're going to spend the whole week kind of unpacking this, but, but for somebody that wants to turn off because they're like, no, you don't understand the struggle. You don't understand me. That's not true. That feels uh, too easy. That feels like a write-off. That feels like you're just empowering me to eat snicker bars and ho-hos and ding-dongs. What do you say to that? This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. As we head into the new year, I want us to have an honest conversation about some things that could help our mental health. Now, if you know me, I'm an ardent supporter of therapy and theology. Maybe you're ready to take a next step in counseling or therapy. Whether you've been in therapy or not, I think it's a good time to process emotions and learn how to develop personal emotional health. The good thing about BetterHelp is that it's completely online. So maybe you are looking for something convenient or flexible or suited to your schedule. If you're thinking about counseling or therapy or just need someone to talk to about a situation to process your emotions, I really recommend BetterHelp.com. You can go to BetterHelp.com slash going there and get 10% off your first month of counseling. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P.com slash going there. Well, I, I will say that's kind of diet mentality, right? So we're either on, we're either this side or that side. The pendulum, we don't realize that the pendulum can stop in the middle than the nuance, right? Diet culture makes us miss the nuance. And let me tell you, I was on a federal jury trial one time. And at the very end, the judge came to me and said, Leslie, if I ever need a skeptic, I'm coming to you. He pointed right at me. He goes, the whole time you had this look on your face. I, it was, I was, I was upset because it was a long time, but to be there, but I was such a skeptic. And I really think that's how I ended up where I am because to the person who's like, I don't, I don't believe that. Surely there's a way for me to conform to what the world has told me my body should be or could be. But when I started digging in and doing my own work postgraduate school, like I had to unlearn so much stuff. So when I started digging in and realizing that I could be bringing people to harm by trying to help them shrink their bodies to fit a cultural ideal that I really wrestled with this for, I pro- it probably took me almost three years as a professional to step from like a weight focused approach to a weight neutral approach because I'm such a skeptic and I, I was digging into the information and we have the same level of evidence that smoking causes cancer. We have, that's the highest level of evidence, like randomized controlled trials in the research world. Like it's the best we've got. We have the same level of evidence that weight loss attempts, weight loss dieting harm our bodies physically. And it's the same level of evidence that we ignore because diet culture Weight registered nutritionist, registered dietitian, 
Wait, are you telling me that dieting hurts my body? Yes. And it denies divine design that we are all diverse. And if we're trying to shrink Cody to look like someone else, we're denying how he was made. Mm. And so... So yes, and then we're doing we're bringing him to harm by one not feeding these bodies that have to have food. God gave us hunger signals for a reason. Um, like these bodies are designed to to stay nourished um, at whatever size they are, and and diet culture is the reason we don't believe this. And as a fellow skeptic. I dug into it and realized, wow, I have brought people to harm in my career as, as a baby dietitian until I learned to, to do differently. Um, and nobody ever wrote me a thank you note for putting them on the diet. <laughs> but I'm sure, I'm sure at the very least, there is going to be some people on social media that say, thank you for the freedom that you're giving me now. Okay. So I'm going to encourage everyone not to stop listening after episode one, because we are going to unpack this further. But the first time that I started hearing this, I just thought like it was, I have spent years beating my body into submission, trying to fit into this elusive size, trying to like count my calories and measure, measure my life in teaspoons and measuring cups. And it's yeah. painful, it's hard. And it's feeling like I am on the treadmill and I'm running miles and I'm having a chicken breast and five ounces of broccoli, and I'm perfectly trying to portion everything. And my life is miserable as I am living like a slave. I'm living a slave to caloric, caloric intake. And, yeah. and what I realized in reading um, your book and then talking to you is that this, this ideology is pervasive and permeates every aspect of culture in yeah. places that should feel safe. Like going to the doctors should feel like a safe place. And yet uh, it, it's become unsafe because of diet culture. Then okay. let me tell as, as somebody who's a leader in church, as somebody who's a pastor, as somebody who is a church planter, let me say that it is made it safe. Not it's made its way, not just into safe places. It's made its way into sacred places yes. at the church. The church should be a place where there is freedom. And yet, uh, and I have fallen prey to this, not just receiving these words, but I hate even saying like, co-signing on them. I have taught on our body as a temple. I have taught on the proverb that says, if you are taken to gluttony, put a knife to your throat. I have taught. And I, we have a lot to discuss and a lot to unpack and it's okay if we disagree, but I'm saying all of this because this feels so revolutional. So when I say that this uh, ideology is pervasive and it has permeated all aspects of culture, where do you see it? And how can we walk people through creating places of safety as we have conversations about our weight, yeah. dieting, health, numbers on the scale, all of it. Yeah. Yeah. So I was like, we see it in our homes, right? Like I grew up, my grandmother, I love her so much, but Nanny was always counting points. <laughs> Nanny was always counting points. Nanny was always. Because <laughs> girl, I know, I know. Keep coming, keep, keep coming. You yes. know, and like meant well, you know, however. So, you know, like Nanny's like this most um, beautiful like she was a nurse, entrepreneur, like amazing lady, but always worried that her body was too big when she was fine. You know, so we saw that growing up. So we see it in our homes um, from very well-meaning loved ones. We see it at the doctors, like the first, when you go to a medical office, they're like, let's um, get your weight. I'm like, let's not. No, thank you. Um, which you can do, by the way. So, um, but yeah, wow. so the, and the weight check is like, of course, my blood pressure is going to be high. I was getting ready to put up a fight about telling you that I'm not stepping on the scales, <laughs> you know, so um of course, my blood pressure is going to be high, and especially when people are shamed, right? Then you get a lecture about it and you're really there for pink eye. And that was not helpful at all. So sometimes we we um, we run into it um, in our schools. And my daughter, like we've been talking about this for a long time. Um, she's very well aware of what I call health propaganda. And so she'll come home. She'll be like, Mom, look at this. She learned how to spell propaganda early. But um, and it was because of diet culture. And it was like good food, bad food and very dichotomous thinking. And there's so much more that, to food than like put it in, putting it in categories. Um, and just even recently, one of my colleagues was like, my teenage daughter just came home with a calorie counting assignment. And we have so much information that those types of assignments cause harm and trigger disordered eating behaviors and eating disorders. And then, like you said, we see it in the church. We see it with 
possibly out of on, out of context verses. We see it with body shaming people who live in larger bodies, either by divine design or disease state or whatever. Um, and dieting is the number one predictor of living in a, bo- a body larger than your genetic design. So dieting causes people to have metabolic adapt- adaptations that make them increase kind of their genetic set point of where the sweet spot where your body wants to just just hang out and then you'll see kind of I remember a church I went to a long time ago I would see kind of diety bible studies and you know weight watcher weigh-ins at church things like that that um we are spending so much time trying to make these bodies take up less space when we're designed to take up the space we're to take up the space, to feed the purpose. Um, and so, yeah, we've got to get rid of diet culture in our safe places. And at the very least, we got to see it. Okay. And I also am going to say that within uh, church culture, as you've already mentioned, but even just small remarks like, oh, look, my hot wife has just lost 20 pounds. Well, what, mm-hmm. did, what did we indicate? That your wife wasn't hot when she was thicky, thicky, thick. Right. What did and- you highlight that skinny is ideal? Yeah, and valuable, the, right? Value, yep. Your value is associated to your waist size or the weight yeah. on the scale. And yeah. I, I just feel like it's now that you've pointed this out, and now that I'm becoming more uh, diet culture aware, I'm seeing it everywhere. I'm seeing it everywhere. And I know yes. that there's someone out there that's like super frustrated and just feels like, but you're not addressing the health aspect. Because when we first started talking and you were t- talking about body diversity and body positivity, I was getting low key kind of annoyed because I'm coming off of a culture where I love that people are embracing their bodies. Like I absolutely love it. Where I am tempered and where I am cautious is that it's almost felt like we've given license to run amok and do whatever we want with our bodies. Right. We're going to be addressing that this week on the podcast. We yeah. are running out of time, but I actually want to leave this with this. Uh, I want to leave us with a little bit of a cliffhanger and a little bit of a I'm not sure we're going to disagree so that people know I'm going to, I'm going to go toe to toe and blow to blow with my sister, Leslie on this. Okay. So let's talk about gluttony as we wrap up this episode, this is going to be a cliffhanger for tomorrow. Um, I read this in the book and I feel like it's worthy of a conversation, but um, while we are prepping for this week of content, which yes, we prep because we want to make sure every episode is fire for our listeners, but I had shared with you kind of walking in this guilt of Trader Joe's has these sinfully indulgent maple leaf cream filled cookies. Yeah. They're the best. They're okay. Okay. I can't have them in my house. Well, this is what I told you. I can't have them in my house because they're so tempting and all this other stuff. And each one is 110 calories each and da, 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 da. Well, in a moment of, I don't know, delusion, happiness, sadness, the verdict's still out. I'm like, I'm going to get these maple leaf vanilla cream filled cookies and they're in my house. And I was talking to you about them and you said, Bianca, what's wrong with having one cookie? And I was like, well, they're bad. These cookies are really bad. And you're like, okay, well, what if I put one cookie in your lunchbox every single day? At some point, you're going to get used to it and not feel like it's bad or have that desire. Because what happens is that you have made that bad and yet you desire it. And what it triggered in me was my painful realization that I have a negative relationship with food. Food has become like that bad ex-boyfriend that I don't want, but I come back to. And then it's been so dysfunctional. And what I want to address is the dysfunction that I know I'm not the only one. I will be the first one to tell myself so that other people can go second. But I just feel like we need to have honest conversations about our relationship with food and the dysfunction we have with our relationship with food. Here, here, I want to have a cliffhanger. You talk about uh, gluttony and... um, and you addressed this earlier. You had said our we can nourish our primal need of hunger. And like hunger pains are there for a reason. This feels so crazy for me because when I would have hunger pains, it was like fight through it. You don't, you don't need that. You know, the best way to lose weight is in dining. In dining means that your body eats its own fat, which it just feels so scary to even say out loud. But this is the journey I'm on. Okay. So I am actually going to leave this with our readers and we can come back and discuss this tomorrow. But you talk about gluttony and in um In your section on gluttony, you said a glutton is someone, it's defined, the simplest definition I can find suggests that a glutton is someone who enjoys excess or is overindulgent. And then you go and parse this out. You actually, 
this is where I completely agree with you. And someone needs to hear this. Gluttony is a heart problem. When I read that, I said, finally, somebody who has seen it and can say it. Gluttony is not what is on our plate. Gluttony is what is in our heart. So I agree with you on that. But then you said this, you said gluttony is a heart problem, comma, not quote, what you eat or quote, how you eat problem. Now, are you ready to fight? Can we, can we, can we go there? We'll do some wrestling. Okay. You said, I interviewed a wise theologian and diet culture informed pastor who told me that gluttony essentially involves taking more than our share or hoarding in a way that doesn't allow access to others. So one word that I don't, okay. So I'm a word nerd. Okay. I will fight. I will fight on this. But he said that gluttony essentially, when somebody says essentially, I'm like, well, then that's not the full answer. So I'm holding on to the first answer that you mentioned on page 108. Anyone who gets a book, you can go back and check this. And using this theologian and this diet sensitive, diet culture informed pastor, gluttony essentially involves taking more than our share or hoarding in a way that doesn't allow access to others. You in your book said that you've never met a glutton. And this is where I'm going to push back because I'm going to take a look at, let's just say the USA. We eat more than we, than so many other countries on the place, on the planet. And yet we throw away. So our mm-hmm. consumption and our waste is so high that when I look at his definition it, it, of taking more than our share or hoarding in a way that doesn't allow others to have excess, I'm looking at the continent of Africa. I'm mm-hmm. looking at Latin America. I'm looking about hungry Asia. And I'm saying, by definition, if we as Americans just have one portion, and it doesn't have to be a tiny portion, if we just have one portion mm-hmm. and we package food for the world, we could not be gluttonous. Talk to me about uh, this concept of gluttony. And then I want to pack this out to maybe make it less global and more specific. But how do you address gluttony with the perspective of we are eating more than we should and we have more than we can, than we have been sharing? I think that's a really good, a really good analogy of a system that is gluttonous. I think America, I mean, we hoard power, we hoard food like that. That I think that's a really great definition of, of gluttonous. So, I mean, we do have access. We're also probably one of the few countries that has tremendous access to food and chooses to not eat it. Oof. And that is diet culture. And so the the pervasiveness of diet culture plays into how we feel about our own bodies and other people's bodies and ties in to what we would call gluttonous behavior. And I have not seen it in my practice because people generally land in front of me because they've been told their body is wrong their whole life and they're just hungry. And at nighttime, after they've been good, air quotes, all day, which means restricted, they're hungry and they eat too much. And I have never sat across from someone where I agreed with them when they said they were gluttonous because that the person didn't say, Leslie, I'm, cap- I'm taking all this food and my neighbor's hungry. They're not saying that. They're saying, Leslie, I have access to all this food and I can't eat it because this culture told me my body was bad, but then I'm so hungry at night and I eat 12 maple cookies. And what I say to that Girl, is- my living room. Why well, you are know, you- You know the maple cookies are my thing too. So I mean, like they're, they're a thing. <laughs> Love them so much. But it's really like, we really have to see how diet culture has permeated even how- We look at these things, we judge bodies, we judge behaviors because of this diet culture lens. And so I agree, like we are in the wealthiest country with the greatest food supply and we choose to restrict it. Mm. So for those who are listening on the podcast and they feel like, well, no, that's not me. We're going to end this episode with a quiz that Leslie has put together. Um, I put here, are you a slave to diet culture? Um, do you Should we call that the quiz? Or do you want to call the quiz, is diet cult- culture keeping you stuck? Which one do you like? However it lands with people. 
Okay. Oh, I love it. It's like pick your own adventure. If you like my title, you can vote on Instagram. If you like Leslie's title, you can vote on Instagram. Um, but this is the test. And 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 I'm I have subjected myself as the guinea pig in your uh proverbial a therapist chair. And I want you to press in the same way that I'm going to press you. I want you to press in because I believe that because I have such a sordid past with food and food yeah. addiction and disordered eating. And we can talk about that later. Uh, I feel like I want to give voice for those that maybe don't feel confident or comfortable yeah. talking about this. So here is the quiz. Um, take it away, Leslie. All right. So, um, True or false? Okay, I how many questions here are listeners? How many questions are there? Okay, there are five questions. Okay, and it's yes, true or false? Is yes on it's, all of them? Or yes um, or false on all of them? Okay, true, or, true or false. And if you true answer false. true to any of them, diet Don't tell culture. Us. Okay. Don't tell us that. Skirt, skirt, back that up. Okay, ready? <laughs> all right, true or false? True or false? I count calories often or fear certain foods. True or false? Uh, true. I feel, yeah. <laughs> Maybe I set people up. But anyway, I feel so guilty when I let myself eat certain foods. True. Okay. I use a scale often to determine if I'm healthy. Uh, I mean, I'm going to say true because it's a little bit more true, but I'm somewhere in the middle. Okay. I often avoid medical visits because of the weight check. False. Okay. I skip meals or ignore hunger regularly. True. Okay. So. so what's my score? I feel like it's bad. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you answer true to any of them, diet culture is probably in the driver's seat. Wait, if you said yes to any of them? Yeah. Ooh, honey. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. So friends and family listening to this podcast, this is just the beginning, but my, my hope is that once you see diet culture, that you won't be able to unsee it. I really do believe that there's a mandate in my life to bring freedom to people. And I had said this earlier, you can't take people to places you've never been. Mm -hmm. I'm on a journey. I don't want to live my life in teaspoons and measuring cups. I don't want to live my life uh, determining the, the goodness or the quality of the day based on how much I weigh in the morning. And so uh, Leslie's has this book for those. It's in the show notes, but it's entitled Feed Your Soul. You can click the link directly to Amazon and get your copy. But this week, we're going to be asking hard questions and hopefully getting answers that will pique our interest and more, most importantly, take us to a place of freedom. I don't often do this on the podcast, but this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to close in prayer because this is such a hard topic. And anyone who has wrestled with uh, having a funky relationship with food, food addiction, uh, or e even eating disorders or disordered eating. I believe that this is a spiritual stronghold on so many people. And Jesus said that we can find freedom in him. And this is what I want for people. So I'm going to close out this episode and uh, really believe that our lives will be different after this week. And so if y'all feel comfortable, join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for the conversation that is had. But in this moment, I am just asking divinely by your spirit for strongholds to be broken. And let it start with me, God. The way that I have viewed myself, my body, my relationship with food, this toxic ex-boyfriend, I pray, Jesus, that my heart is aligned with you, that I read scripture and that it fills my spiritual soul. And when I sit at the table, I don't have to be afraid of eating to feed my physical body. I pray for freedom, God. I pray blessings over Leslie and the words that she has imparted into us. Go before our podcast listeners and may freedom be found. To you be the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. We love you, friends, and we can't wait to join in tomorrow's discussion. If you have questions, go ahead and pop them in uh, on social media. Otherwise, we will catch you tomorrow for a new episode.